third part of chapter nine of the first volume of the life of reason this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by fredrik karlsson the life of reason by george santayana side note and transcendent thought is thus an expression of natural relations as will is of natural affinities yet consciousness of an object's value while it declares the blind disposition to pursue that object constitutes its entire worth apart from the pains and satisfactions involved an impulse and its execution would be alike destitute of importance it would matter nothing how chaotic or how orderly the world became or what animal bodies arose or perished there any tendencies afoot in nature whatever they might construct or dissolve would involve no progress or disaster since no preferences would exist to pronounce one eventual state of things better than another these preferences are in themselves if the dynamic order alone be considered works of supererogation expressing force but not producing it like a statue of hercules but the principle of such preferences the force they express and depend upon is some mechanical impulse itself involved in the causal process expression gives value to power and the strength of hercules would have no virtue in it had it contributed nothing to art and civilization that conceived basis of all life which we call matter would be a mere potentiality an inferred instrument deprived of its function if it did not actually issue in life and consciousness what gives the material world a legitimate status and perpetual pertinence in human discourse is the conscious life it supports and carries in its own direction as a ship carries its passengers or rather as a passion carries its hopes conscious interests first justify and moralize the mechanisms they express eventual satisfactions while their form and possibility must be determined by animal tendencies alone render these tendencies vehicles of the good the direction in which benefit shall lie must be determined by irrational impulse but the attainment of benefit consists in crowning that impulse with its ideal achievement nature dictates what men shall seek and prompts them to seek it a possibility of happiness is thus generated and only its fulfilment would justify nature and man in their common venture side note it is the seat of value satisfaction is the touchstone of value without reference to it all talk about good and evil progress or decay is merely confused verbiage pure sophistry in which the juggler adroitly withdraws attention from what works the wonder namely that human and moral colouring to which the term he plays with owe whatever efficacy they have metaphysicians sometimes so define the good as to make it a matter of no importance not seldom they give that name to the sum of all evils a good absolute in the sense of being divorced from all natural demand and all possible satisfaction would be as remote as possible from goodness to call it good is mere disloyalty to morals brought about by some fantastic or dialectical passion in excellence there is an essential bias an opposition to the possible opposite this bias expresses a mechanical impulse a situation that has stirred the senses and the will impulse makes value possible and the value becomes actual when the impulse issues in processes that give it satisfaction and have a conscious worth character is the basis of happiness and happiness the sanction of character footnote d aristippus asked socrates 
whether he knew anything good, so that if he answered by naming food or drink or money or health or strength or valor or anything of that sort, he might at once show that it was sometimes an evil. Socrates, however, knew very well that if anything troubles us, what we demand is its cure, and he replied in the most pertinent fashion. Are you asking me, he said, if I know anything good for a fever? Oh, no, said the other, or for sore eyes, not that either, or for hunger, no, not for hunger. Well, then, said he, if you ask me whether I know a good that is good for nothing, I neither know it nor want to know it. End quotation, Xenophon, Memorabilia, Section 3, Part 8 End footnote That thought is nature's concomitant expression or entelechy, never one of her instruments, is a truth long ago divined by the more judicious thinkers like Aristotle and Spinoza. But it has not met with general acceptance or even consideration. It is obstructed by superficial empiricism, which associates the better known aspects of events directly together, without considering what mechanical bonds may secretly unite them. It is obstructed also by the traditional mythical idealism, intent as this philosophy is on proving nature to be the expression of something ulterior and non-natural, and on hugging the fatal misconception that ideals and eventual goods are creative and miraculous forces, without perceiving that it thereby renders goods and ideals perfectly senseless. For how can anything be a good at all to which some existing nature is not already directed? It may therefore be worthwhile, before leaving this phase of the subject, to consider one or two prejudices, which might make it sound paradoxical to say, as we propose, that ideals are ideal and nature natural. Side note. Apparent utility of pain. Side note its real impotence. Of all forms of consciousness, the one apparently most useful is pain, which is also the one most immersed in matter and most opposite to ideality and excellence. Its utility lies in the warning it gives. In trying to escape pain, we escape destruction. That we desire to escape pain is certain. Its very definition can hardly go beyond the statement that pain is that element of feeling which we seek to abolish on account of its intrinsic quality. That this desire, however, should know how to initiate remedial action is a notion contrary to experience and in itself unthinkable. If pain could have cured us, we should long ago have been saved. The bitterest quintessence of pain is its helplessness and our incapacity to abolish it. The most intolerable torments are those we feel gaining upon us, intensifying and prolonging themselves indefinitely. This baffling quality, so conspicuous in extreme agony, is present in all pain and is perhaps its essence. If we sought to describe by a circumlocution what is, of course, a primary sensation, we might scarcely do better than to say that pain is consciousness at once intense and empty, fixing attention on what contains no character and arrests all satisfactions without offering anything in exchange. The horror of pain lies in its intolerable intensity and its intolerable tedium. It can, accordingly, be cured either by sleep or by entertainment. In itself, it has no resource. Its violence is quite helpless, and its vacancy offers no expedience by which it might be unknotted and relieved. Pain is not only impotent in itself, but is a sign of impotence in the sufferer. Its appearance, far from constituting its own remedy, is like all other organic phenomena subject to the law of inertia and tends only to its own continuance. 
a man's hatred of his own condition no more helps to improve it than hatred of other people tends to improve them if we allowed ourselves to speak in such a case of efficacy at all we should say that pain perpetuates and propagates itself in various ways now by weakening the system now by prompting convulsive efforts now by spreading to other beings through the contagions of sympathy or vengeance in fact however it merely betrays a maladjustment which has more or less natural stability it may be instantaneous only by its lack of equilibrium it may involve the immediate destruction of one of its factors in that case we fabulously say that the pain has instinctively removed its own cause pain is here apparently useful because it expresses an incipient tension which the self-preserving forces in the organism are sufficient to remove pain's appearance is then the sign of its instant disappearance not indeed by virtue of its inner nature or of any art it can initiate but merely by virtue of mechanical associations between its cause and its remedy the burned child dreads the fire and reading only the surface of his life fancies that the pain once felt and still remembered is the ground of his new prudence punishments however are not always efficacious as every one knows who has tried to govern children or cities by the rod suffering does not bring wisdom nor even memory unless intelligence and docility are already there that is unless the friction which the pain betrayed sufficed to obliterate permanently one of the impulses in conflict this readjustment on which real improvement hangs and which alone makes experience useful does not correspond to the intensity or repetition of the pains endured it corresponds rather to such a plasticity in the organism that the painful conflict is no longer produced Sidenote. preformations involved threatened destruction would not involve pain unless that threatened destruction were being resisted so that the reaction which pain is supposed to cause must already be taking place before pain can be felt a will without direction cannot be thwarted so that inhibition cannot be the primary source of any effort or of any ideal determinate impulses must exist already for their inhibition to have taken place or for the pain to arise which is the sign of that inhibition the child's dread of the fire marks the acceleration of that impulse which when he was burned originally enabled him to withdraw his hand and if he did not now shrink in anticipation he would not remember the pain nor know to what to attach his terror sight now suffices to awaken the reaction which touch at first was needed to produce the will has extended its line of battle and thrown out its scouts farther afield and pain has been driven back to the frontiers of the spirit the conflicting reactions are now peripheral and feeble the pain involved in aversion is nothing to that once involved in the burn had this aversion to fire been innate as many aversions are no pain would have been caused because no profound maladjustment would have occurred the surviving attraction checked by fear is a remnant of the old disorganization in the brain which was the seat of conflicting reactions end of chapter nine part three